Welcome back to part two of Chuck and the Bear, the final installment where we see what happens to Chuck. The purpose of this two-part vlog is to give insight and demonstrate how we can use standards, even the wrong standards, to provide a method for assessing risks, hazards, identifying the orders of magnitudes of those forces, temperatures, stresses, whatever the variable with which we're concerned, how we can quantify what is likely to happen in real life and develop simple strategies to avoiding hazards. If you haven't viewed part one of the vlog, I recommend you stop watching now and go and watch part one. Okay, so we've set the scene, we've identified the static forces, we've identified 4G as the classic impulse that we're likely to see. Now we're going to look quickly at the overall requirements of 950, put in some of the figures and see what comes out. From 950, we're going to look at the stability requirements. It simply says that under normal use, Equipment shall not become physically unstable to the degree that it becomes a hazard to the operator or to a service person. The unit must not fall over when tilted to 10 degrees, when 250 newtons, a mass of, equivalent to a mass of about 56 pounds, is applied to any surface except upwards, or when 800 newtons is applied to any surface up to one meter, three feet, above the ground. This is perceptive. Now, these forces relate to static forces exerted by a 180 pound man. So what could the equivalence be when we scale this up to an angry 3000 pound bear? Just for kicks, let's take our 4G impulse multiplier and operate that on a 2000 pound bear. So we could imagine now we could have 8000 pounds of dynamic force at work with a bear stomping onto something or someone. Fortunately, that doesn't happen, but Let's go and look to see what does. So we have a container weighing about 300 pounds, acted on by an up force of 2,400 pounds, the impulse of the bear. The acceleration force is going to be about 2,100 pounds. That means the bear could accelerate the container or chuck with a force of 2,100 pounds over a, a distance of about three feet, simply by extending its arms. So if we do the math of E equals force times distance, we can calculate that Chuck could be thrown to a height of 20 feet by the bear. By doing the simple math, we suddenly realize that the forces at play in here are substantial, they're frightening. So why aren't we doing something to protect ourselves? Or why isn't Chuck doing something to protect himself against this? So we know that bad things can happen, that bad things can happen quickly. And if bad things happen quickly, I cannot outrun or outclimb them. So if bad things happen to me, I will probably die. And what's missing from the picture? To misquote Roger Bacon, he who knows not mathematics may not live long enough to know any other science. What's missing? Chuck made a simple mistake. He had no consideration of the force that the bear could apply and pick the container up and throw it in the air to 20 feet of height. Chuck was not prepared for anything to go wrong. He had no concept of how badly wrong things could go or how quickly, or the forces involved. As engineers, we have studied math, physics, or applied maths, so we have no excuse for not doing some simple sums. Now let's see the rest of the sequence without the tie-down straps. Did Chuck give the bear a mock salute, or did he say something bad about the bear's sister? He sure did something. Let's take another look at the forces we calculated. Man plus container, providing 600 pounds of force downwards, creating friction between the container and the bed of the truck. Painted steel on painted metal, probably a low coefficient, perhaps 0.5, giving 300 pounds of friction. Bare static push, 600 pounds, as we calculated or estimated. Note how this is about right, because the container has moved on the truck bed, and the bear isn't angry yet. The container's moving, so Chuck is holding on for dear life. Unfortunately, to hold on to the bar, he has to lunge towards the front of the container towards the angry bear. The bear now thinks Chuck is about to attack. The angry bear now applies an impulse of up to plus and minus 2,400 pounds of force as it shakes the container with Chuck hanging on. They all come tumbling down. The bear sees Chuck lunge at its throat as the container, 300 pounds, falls on its foot and causes it a lot of pain. Bad things usually happen fast. While the bear is getting the container off its perhaps broken foot and Chuck staggers to his feet, can anybody remember the one thing that would have prevented this from happening? 
The tie-down straps. Yes, tie-down straps equals good. Preventative measures are usually good. But round two is about to start. Chuck seems to be up on his feet before the bear does, but once the bear gets out from under the container, he strikes with lightning speed. It seems that when the container struck the bear's foot, it caused sufficient pain to make it concede defeat, and that the final swipe of its paw was an expression of frustration and defeat. Would the outcome have been worse if the container had not hurt the bear so much? Was the outcome predictable or based on plain dumb luck? It could have been a whole lot worse, but it could also have been avoided. Doing something wrong and not getting hurt shows good luck. It does not show good judgment. During the design and review processes, here are some questions to ask yourself. What are the risks? What could go wrong? And how could we eliminate those risks? Questions to ask your team are, have you reviewed the product against an appropriate standard? Have you reviewed the product against any standard? Have you performed a risk assessment? Thank you for taking the time to listen to this blog. It's intended to be amusing. We find it makes important lessons easier to remember when, and it also gives us a methodology by which we can work through basic issues, facts, problems, and evolve a solution. Please forward this to your friends and colleagues. If you received it as a forward, don't forget to go to our website and register as a VIP member. That way you'll get more free stuff. HTTP phoenixtechnicalgroup.com slash join hyphen our hyphen VIP hyphen list. Thanks a lot. This is Greg Kerville.